Thanks very much, uh, all of you that took part in the opening today and that uh, uh, opening presentation that we have this morning. And we thank you. We're thankful that you're all here this morning. It's by God's grace that any one of us can walk in through any door. And uh, we're glad that we're, we're here this morning to just uh, be able in freedom to open up God's word and to speak from it, to learn from it. And I pray today that definitely God would speak to us through it. It's, uh, you know, I, well, it's, I have to depend a lot on, on what God will do with his word. And uh, we believe here that it is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and able to pierce the, the content, the intents of the heart and uh, able to divide what the, the motives are of the heart and the, uh, be able to get into our hearts and work. Um, the reason why we, we exist here at Read of You is to proclaim definitely we speak in Christ as the verse said and our passage will say we're here to, to speak on behalf of Christ. Um, we don't have any authority to do that, but God gives us the authority to represent him and we speak these things from God in Christ. And so it's not just um, the God that's out there that has no personal connection with anybody. But his personal connection is through Christ, and we speak as though where Christ is ministering um, to us here and serving us. I pray today that there be some things said that would get through to us, and uh, we might focus on the things that really matter. Um, in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 12 to 17, we're, we're taking the book of 2 Corinthians here at the chapel, and um, it's a letter that Paul wrote. Paul the Apostle wrote, many of the letters in the New Testament. And he wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, where he had been ministering there for three years. And just before that, he visited Corinth and established the church there. And then he came up to Ephesus, and he, he was there for about three years, and he sent uh, 1 Corinthians a letter, or the letter of 1 Corinthians to Corinth by Timothy. And then problems in that church arose. You imagine, well, the church isn't a perfect place. Uh, you know, 1 Corinthians is like God taking the roof off the church and he looks in and you see all, all the good stuff, all the bad stuff that were just people trying to get along and uh, through God's grace. And, and that's really what we are through all the, the dirt and the mud and the, everything else. Where God's grace will shine over that. And, and really, we, we see problems in the, the church at Corinth. And uh, so Timothy had this message that he was bringing back from Paul. He wrote a letter and said, you know, uh, kind of like a, a little bit of a spiritual kick in the butt. And, um, and then he, <clears throat> he went back to, on, on a second missionary journey, we're going to see, we're going to take some of these journeys here that Paul did. Um, he, he wrote uh, Second Corinthians, um, and uh, he sent that by Titus, and uh, Titus had uh, given them some instruction on how to behave as well. And we see... Uh, the second Corinthians, mainly a letter uh, written to Corinth, uh, basically to praise them on the responses that he had given them initially to correct their ways. And they repented of their ways as a church, and they, they came back to just uh, putting Christ first and the things that matter. And um, so um, throughout Paul's life, definitely in these little verses that we're going to look at today, um, when I was just uh, contemplating these things, I, I just... I thought, you know, there's, there's a few things here that, that um, come out in, in these verses that, that really mattered to Paul. And I just think, you know, we can get caught up in a lot of things um, with, with our Christian lives. And some of the things really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. And in these verses today, um, we're going to consider the things that matter. I'm just going to try to get this thing going again and see if this will, there we go. Okay, so the first thing here is the good news in Jesus Christ. So um, what came to uh, the forefront with Paul in his life is the good news of Jesus Christ. And now we're gonna elaborate on that. What is the good news? It can be termed the gospel. And I know that, uh, you know, if you haven't really heard much of this word before, what is the gospel? Well, it's the good news. Why was it called the good news in Jesus Christ? And then we have number two, the gatherings of believers in Christ. That's like a church, basically. What is a church? Um, you know, for, for us, you might think of a church as a building as you drive down the road with a nice steeple and it's pointing to heaven and there's a cross on it. And 
Well, this is what, what came through in these verses to me was that Paul was deeply concerned about the churches that he went and visited and he established. He, his heart was for them. And uh, I think the second thing that really mattered to Paul was, was uh, the church, those that gathered uh, together uh, in Christ's name. And then um, another thing that mattered to Paul, well, we're going to see here uh, the, the monumental things he did for God. Now, none of us here are the Apostle Paul. Okay, he was selected, I agree, for a certain purpose. But you know what? There was nothing really in him uh, that he could depend on himself to do the magnificent things that he did for God and for Christ. Uh, he had to depend on God's help to do this. And we're going to see some of these things here as we go through some of these verses. And, and the second epistle to Corinth in general, we're going to learn of some of these things uh, facing amazing difficulties. He was able to do uh, things for God that uh, no one else has really been able to do. And we benefit from and 13 letters or so written in the New Testament for us today to read from. But you know, he didn't point to himself. He, is, he said in these verses, who is sufficient for such a task as this to represent God here, to represent Christ on earth? None of us really are. And he says, my sufficiency in chapter three, my sufficiency is of God. It's not of me. And we're going to just kind of uh, prevent ourselves from stealing too much from next week's message. But, but, but really, this is another thing that came forward to me that really mattered to Paul. So number one, what really mattered to him was the good news that he was about to share with a whole lot of people and to go through a whole lot of conflict doing it. And I asked myself the question, uh, why would such a person, what would make such a person do that? And we can relate this to ourselves to some degree. Number two, then the, 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 the church as well really mattered to Paul. And uh, he would forego the success he was having on a gospel campaign. And he would then turn his heart to the people of Corinth. That's how uh, uh, desperate he was for them to see them do well. And then also, too, he had nothing in himself. And so hopefully we'll... We'll cover this as God helps him. God will help us to see some of these things. And so things that matter to Paul, number one, the good news in Jesus Christ. And let's just open our Bibles, please. I know Mike, uh, in his opening, uh, referred to some of these verses already, to one verse in particular. But we're going to read the, the five verses that are responsible to us today. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and uh, verse 12. It says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance, fragrance of his knowledge in every place, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity and as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. And so we see here that our first point here was that one of the things that mattered most to Paul was that he was, able, he was able to take Christ's gospel to a place called Troas and through a lot of other different places in Asia and uh, in Macedonia and eventually Italy as well. As he came forward in his, in his pursuit for Christ, he came and brought this message uh, to many people. And... Um, we're just going to look at the good news here. What does it mean, the gospel of Christ? Well, it's referred to uh, in other translations as the good news. Some translations will say gospel. Well, what is the good news? I mean, is it really good news to me? If I hear this good news, well, what is the good news about Jesus Christ? Well, it's something that really connects us to the transforming love of God. We can speak about God in a generic way, but unless it involves uh, the good news from Jesus Christ, we fail to make that connection to the transforming power of God and the transforming love of God. We fail to make that relationship establishment with God himself. There are many um, uh, things out there that talk about spiritual exercises out there that uh, refer to God and in a generic way, 
But um, uh, when we speak from the Bible here, we want to talk about Jesus Christ as that good news that would connect us to God. He is the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so we see here, um, what kind of person was Paul? I mean, to what was the good news that Paul had? I mean, if he experienced, uh, he was spreading the good news, he'd have to experience good news himself. But what was it? I hope you can read this here. Uh, this was Paul himself. I am a pure, um, and I'm quoting from the New Living Translation. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. Imagine. So in, in the name of religion, his own religion and his, and, his, and his affinity to that practice, he is persecuting the church. That, that doesn't seem to make sense here. And as for the righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Hmm, imagine. So, so he's met Christ. This was different. Some of us will equate Christ with religion and church and everything else, but it, what this the verse says different here. It's different than a religion. He's meeting Christ. And if we didn't read that today, but it's experience of meeting Christ, Christ had told him, stop persecuting me when he was persecuting the church. He, he, he sentenced people to death in the church in, in sort of reaction to being um, committed to his own religion. And this Christ stuff was coming into the culture of that day, and uh, it was contrary to what his beliefs were. But then he met Christ. And it says, now I consider them worthless. All these things that I've done in my past for this righteousness that I had of myself, I, I consider it worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless because of what Christ has done. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And so he trusted. He saw Christ as separate from religion. He saw him as a person that he would be able to connect with by faith. And that would uh, be the good news. He was released from this life that he had to pressure himself with by obeying the law and making sure that he was just perfectly uh, obeying the law and perfectly living his life before God, what he thought he was doing the right thing. But when he met Christ, it took all of that away. And I would say that that's the good news of Jesus Christ. It would take all the performance of you, what you have to do before a holy and righteous God away. And you find you're all in Christ to do that for you. And that is part of the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to just go forward from there. I mean, it was this good news now that prompted him to do all these missionary journeys. I apologize if you can't see all that. You can turn in the back of your Bibles to see the first and the second and the third. And some would say his journey to Rome was the fourth missionary journey. But what would prompt such a man to react so powerfully and say, Lord, I'm for you. This is so good, this message that I've received that I want to spread it. No doubt, yes, God had a purpose for him beyond what maybe is, is in our realm today, but he still works through us. He spreads the aroma of Christ as, as we were looking at earlier this morning, uh, but he, he, what would possess a man to do this amount of walking and, and, and everything else? I, I looked this up and I thought, wow, I wonder how, I wonder how many miles Paul traveled, I mean, to do all this stuff. Now, we just want to get some reference point here. So this is where we are today. Uh, where is Troas? Troas is right there, okay? <clears throat> so he started all down here, and he went up into this area here for his first one. Then the purple one here is his second missionary journey. And right here uh, at Troas, there was some significant events that happened. One is today that we read of. Then be, um, and the, that was during the third missionary journey of today. But then the, the first one was up in Troas here. But this is where we are right here. And um, all the, these miles that he put on his feet. And basically, uh, it was about um, 10,000 miles by foot. And um, this is basically when you look at it, uh, sort of in our terms, um, if you were to take your, your, your walking shoes, uh, put the best ones you have on and uh, go to the running room, get some good shoes. And uh, it's a round trip from Ottawa to Miami three times. So that's a round trip. So if you started walking from Ottawa to Miami and back, that's one trip. Do three trips of those. 
Now you're getting a sense of what Paul did. It's 44 kilometers every day for 14 years. So he, he took something that was really convincing to him that released him from religion. He had in his heart a, a devotion to do everything right and to fill up all the, 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 the requirements of the law that he might be pleading to God. And yet he meets someone who is typically uh, understood as representing a religion of some sort, as you understand it today, but he met Jesus Christ that was something different. And it took him away from that. And he says, I got to share this. And he walks the equivalent of 44 kilometers every day for 14 years to do this. Now, on YouTube, I could probably punch in, um, I want to go on a holiday, I want to do Paul's missionary journeys, and it's not going to be through all the stuff that he went through. Uh, once in a while, I'll drop you off and show you different things, but, you know, and it's all sort of uh, planned out and safe and you're protected and everything else, but, but you know something? As I read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, three times he was beaten with rods, he was once stoned, three times shipwrecked, spending a whole night adrift at sea, traveled many long journeys, faced dangers from rivers, from robbers, uh, dangers from the Jews, from the Gentiles, dangers in the cities, in deserts and on the seas, faced danger from people who call themselves believers and are not, many sleepless nights, hungry, thirsty, shivered in the cold. And there was something in him that just made him see his all sufficiency in God. And, and he just wanted desperately to share this. He went through all this land sharing that good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray this morning that the gospel that is sometimes termed and translated good news would be good news for us. As we read in our passage today, it doesn't always resonate with us, does it? I mean, some will bask in the good news of Jesus Christ, and some will not. And, um, and that's okay. It's just the way it is. Um, but we're going to learn later uh, about the events at Troas, where um, the door was open, and Christ had done a work. Hard to do the work of spiritual stuff, spiritual work with the door closed sometimes. And the door needs to be opened as in our passage today, but we're gonna to get to that. So in some places, sometimes it means a lot to us. We do smell that aroma. The aroma of Christ goes up. Sometimes it's nauseating to us, and sometimes it's a pleasant smell. Um, sometimes my wife will use some of these little odors in the house to spread some nice things in these uh i forget what they're called um but you know you put them in these little canisters and a little bit of smoke goes up and fills the room with some air and depends on what you put in them you might like them or not and sometimes they're nauseating sometimes they're good okay so um just uh you know watch what you put in uh, my wife's stocking okay for christmas anyways um but here we are we're going to just speak a minute about <clears throat> the gospel of jesus christ in a few verses here. We just want to read these because I think it's important um, to go over some of these things about what the gospel is, what the good news is, okay? Uh, look for things that are good here. Uh, John 1, 10 to 13. He came into the very world. That's Christ came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Then the next verse, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. As we read, there is a consequence. There are those that respond to the gospel and the, the aroma of Christ is sweet, there are those that don't respond or don't accept or don't believe it. And uh, those, the Bible says, um, will have another alternative um, demise, and that's called perishing. Um, he who has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son is condemned. And um, uh, it's because of what Christ's magnificent work, uh, what he's done on the cross for us, 
This is the reason why. I mean, it's so, it's so monumental what God did through Christ to accomplish redemption and salvation for us that if it's rejected, well, we have no other choice but to uh, uh, fall to our own demise. And that's, and that's what the Bible says is, is perishing or being condemned. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here's some more. For God made Christ who never sinned. This is with him on the cross to be the offering for our sin. So there's a replacement here. Our sin. We don't have to look too far to see that we're just not perfect. So Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Um, and then I have passed on what was most important. This is Paul speaking. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised again the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So he is passing along what was most important to him. And one was the gospel. So at Troas here, um, we see that Paul in the second missionary trip uh, there was a change of course for Paul. Um, he was going to go uh, north. We don't have the map up there, but just at Troas, he was going to go more north. But the Holy Spirit, God directed him, says, "No, you're not. You're not going there. You're 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 going to go over into Macedonia. So across the Aegean Sea. And if you can look kind of off into the horizon there, this is a an old uh, ruin of Troas and the, the Aegean Sea. There, you're going to go off over there. And there was a man there. He saw." He says, come over here into Macedonia. I want you to do a work for me over here. So we see that Paul was directed uh, in his life here at Troas. And, and uh, again, that's, uh, that's Christ working personally in your life. Remember, in the sight of God, in Christ we work. Well, this is, this is God. In the, this is Paul working in the sight of God, but with Christ. Christ was right there with him, um, kind of guiding him, uh, speaking to him. And, and just uh, directing his service for him. And, you know, sometimes the answer is no. When we want to do something else for God, the answer is no. And he, and he turns us another way. We might not realize why at the present time. But nonetheless, we see here that uh, during this third missionary trip, he experiences at Troas again an open door to preach the gospel in Troas. Okay? Well, I just wanted to make a couple of points about this, an open door. Much easier to go into a house when the door is open, or when you can't open the door, isn't there? To experience what all the benefits are of that house. Um, and um, you may not know what's inside that house until you open the door and get in. That's the only way in. Sometimes spiritual things are of the same nature. Um, there may be a lot of questions and confusions about understanding spiritual things, or being able just to, even as a believer to uh, introduce these topics to other people. It, it, you know, you, you, you sense that the door is closed. Oh, you can knock. You can knock at the door. I think we should be knocking at the door. But if we don't have an open door, then I don't know if we should be proceeding. Here in Troas, um, Paul experienced an open door to his um, ministry. And uh, really, I think an open door makes sharing spiritual things easier, in a sense, right? I mean, um, it, it's difficult to kind of force the door open. Uh, it just doesn't work um, when we want to talk about these spiritual things. Um, and um, maybe we shouldn't be forcing the door. Um, wait until the door is opened by the Lord. Um, it, it, the Lord opens the door. Eh? It says in our verse here that a door was opened to me by the Lord. It wasn't Paul that opened the door. As, as good as Paul was, uh, as fearless as he was, as, as, as his strength was found in God, and, 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 and uh, amazingly so, uh, well, he didn't want to push against a door that wasn't opening for him. And you see that in other instances, too, in, in the Second Corinthians, First Corinthians as well, where the door was open, uh, a heart was open, 
And really, uh, we have to rely on, on, on the Lord to, to open the door for us to engage in a spiritual conversation with someone, I think. Um, so, you know, as Christians, are we praying for the open door? Um, when I start before work, um, am I praying for an open door? Sometimes I'm just so consumed with, uh, well, I got to get to work, I got to be on time, got to go open my computer up, got to see what the day brings. Um, am I, first of all, just saying, well, will the Lord open a door for me? Or, Lord, can you open a door for me to speak spiritual things? And then when that door opens, we got to be ready for the open door, don't we? Uh, we got to be ready to walk in and just be able to share that, that good news with the person or just start the conversation on spiritual things. Um, but, you know, the Lord works with us. Remember, I said, in the sight of God with Christ, we work. And so Christ is there with us. He, he knows that person you're working with. He knows everyone. And so he knows those circumstances that they're going through. He can work with them. He can bring them to a point where they will then open the door and you can walk in and you can share, freely share something that God has opened. And so this was an instruction to me here as, as Paul came into Troas, the lessons at Troas. One was that he kind of was directed by the Holy Spirit to go into a different land the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going over here, you're going over there. And then secondly, at Troas, the second visit there, uh, he opened the door to those. Uh, he opened the door for him to minister the gospel to those in Troas at that time. And so here we go from here. So imagine the success you were having as, as Paul the Evangelist, okay? You're having loads of success. The, this is your dream come true. Uh, the Lord is opening the door. You're an evangelist. You're going through... You're taking all these steps and here boom it's open and there's free access to be able to share the gospel with someone but what we learn here is that um, another thing that mattered most to paul was was the, the gatherings of the believers in christ those that were assembled together to, to learn more about christ to 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 mature in him to grow in him and we see this deep concern that paul had for all the churches in second corinthians eleven twenty eight, and um even though he had much success uh, there, he had no rest in his spirit in 2.13 when we read, read that. So you'd think that experiencing the success that he had and being able to kind of say, wow, this is going really good. The gospel campaign is, is on fire and uh, people are listening. God is opening hearts. you think that he'd have um, a tremendous peace about it. I guess he did to some extent, not saying that he didn't. But still in his heart, his heart was pulled to another thing that mattered. And, and basically his heart was at 7.3 there, 2 Corinthians 7.3 when we read that, you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. So the concern for the church was so much that he would die with them and he would live with them. And the condition of the church in Corinth was, was, so, was so grave that he sent a letter, it was called the severe letter to kind of give them a spiritual kick in the butt as it were, and that letter is lost. Um, but um, he wondered how they responded to that, and he was so concerned about the response to that, he didn't want to just—he didn't want to tear them apart and just leave them there. In fact, we're going to read some verses there. That I didn't know if I should send that letter or not. The deliberation that he went through to instruct them—it was definitely by Christ guiding his heart to be able to write something down. And it's so tricky, isn't it, to be able to to be able to um, correct a fellow believer on something, but yet not come across too spiritual or too high-minded yourself because you know yourself you can fall into the same sin but to do that properly in, in Christ's name and with Christ's grace that's really difficult to do but nonetheless he had no rest in his spirit because he wanted to know how they responded to the severe letter that he gave them to correct them on certain matters and it's quite evident to me that when he he leaves he leaves this area of Troas of success he leaves that area and he, he comes into, sorry, he, his heart is, is more for uh, the, the blind of the Corinthian believers. And he says, you know what? I couldn't find Titus. We were supposed to meet. This plan was basically supposed to meeting Titus here in Troas, but I couldn't meet him in Troas. So you know what? We're going to go over to Macedonia and to Philippi. And that's where he, he hooks up with Titus. And he is, he is greatly uh, encouraged by the meeting of Titus. And Titus is news for him about the church and that they had repented of what they had done. And so correction that was given in a Christ honoring way and so, so carefully done by Paul and yet bringing out the correction that was needed. Look at this verse here. 
I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know that it was painful for you for a little while. Now I am glad that I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have. This kind of sorrow leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. And so Paul's unrest in the ministry was turned to joy and encouragement when Titus came to him. He, you know, um, we're going to read some of those verses here. But when he met Titus there, his heart was just turned right around. All this angst that he had about worrying about things um, was turned right around, and he was greatly encouraged um, there. Now, let's just turn in our Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and um, verse 5. Chapter 7, verse 5. We're just going to read about, when we read these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we, we see a great uh, change of emotion, right? So um, he had no rest in his spirit in 13. So 2.13, because I did not find Titus, my brother, but by taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. Now it goes right into verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Now it seems that, that there's something happened there, right? And so what happened there was 2 Corinthians chapter 7. When he came in, he met uh, Titus there in Macedonia. It says here in verse 5 of chapter 7, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. And so we see here that he leaves a place of a, of a successful gospel campaign, but he had no rest in his spirit. Then he comes into Philippi in Macedonia, and, he's, and he says here, well, um, things didn't seem to be much better. Our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. But you know what happened? The news, the good news of how that church was doing really encouraged Paul. And it caused him then to respond like verse 14 of our chapter today, of our, of our verses today. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. And uh, experiencing God's help is, is paramount to living the Christian life. I remember when my wife and I were um, down in Hamilton, I was going to school there, McMaster and... Uh, the assembly down there, great, and um, one of the elders got up and spoke on a, on a Wednesday night or something like that. And, and uh, you know, he said, the Christian life is very tough to live. You can't do it by yourself. You need to live it with the, the help of God. And it's impossible to live by yourself. Well, well, God, why do you call us to it? Well, because when you were first saved, it wasn't on you. The sufficiency of being saved or coming, you know, to, to God's gift wasn't, wasn't on you. you. You accepted it by faith, but he did all the work for it. And so living for him requires the same attitude. It's not us in our, in our righteous works that's going to make us any effectiveness for God ultimately. And so we see the amazing transition in verse 14. When he, he sees through the fightings. He sees through the troubles. And you know what? He can say that God always leads us. You know, who is adequate for such a task as this? And we see that in one of the things that he's helped with is that he remembers that, you know what? When I look around, outside are fears, inside were fighting that says, I can't remember how that goes, but he said here, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Despite all that, God always leads us. God always leads us. And so not to, not to think that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Ever go through some troubles? I wonder if Paul ever thought when he left that gospel campaign, the successful gospel campaign, did he do the right thing? 
goes over to Philippi and Macedonia, and all of a sudden there's, there's trouble there. He's probably thinking, did I do the right thing? We always don't know what to do. We, we will um, make decisions sometimes, but, and we're not trying to make the poor decisions, but sometimes we may feel like we have, but, but God comforts those who are downcast, it says. God comforts those who are discouraged. And so no matter what, no matter what we are going through, we're the bomb of Christ to each other and to those who are not believers. And that's what Paul speaks about here. Um, despite really feeling triumphant, maybe he is tri the triumphant uh, part of it was that Paul had a, a, a kind of heard that the, Corinth, the church at Corinth was responding in a positive way to his instruction, and that made him just feel so good. And the joy that was in his heart for this. And so he knew that the aroma of Christ was being shed abroad, even though these other things were going on. And we can, there's a lot of things that go on in our lives, but let's hold on to Christ fervently. And let's look to him always, because he always leads us in victory in Christ. He always leads us. He always leads us. And we're the bomb, well, we can be the bomb of Christ to each other. And to those who are not believers, we can encourage them to consider becoming a believer and to consider the the circumstances around the, the, the eternal destiny that is spoken of. It's, it's, a, it's a, quite a weight that Paul had to carry the gospel. Um, and we, we learn in 2 Corinthians that he carried it in a jar of clay. That's us, inside of us. We're weak at the very best. We're weak. And yet that amazing gospel, the power that was in that gospel to trust Christ as personal Savior was there. And um, it would uh, spell... Um, joy to those who did not believe at this point but could consider their their destiny in front of an eternal and holy god and then finally the point here about god helping us in the lord's service genuineness genuineness in verse 17. you know that this last phrase here says we speak in the sight of god in christ i keep repeating that today but really this is a this is what makes it genuine it says we're not as many peddling the word of god we're not trying to water it down. We're not trying to tell you just the nice parts about it. We want to tell you everything about the Word of God, and that's the way maybe we should be. Of course we should be, whether it's from the pulpit here or rubbing shoulders with our neighbors or at work. We want to tell you the whole Word of God, to read the entirety of it. You wouldn't just read one chapter of any book, right? Maybe some of us would. But if you want to get the whole picture, not just take one chapter, one book out of context, but take the whole picture and you got to read the whole Bible and what it says. And therefore, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. And um, that's the genuineness that we have. So that he can help us to be genuine as Christians and uh, to be honest and uh, truthful to his word. And so <clears throat> that's it for this morning. And so we had the good news in Jesus Christ, things that mattered to Paul. There's going to be a lot of things that challenge your life that really, your Christian life, really that eventually when you get older, you won't worry about anymore. And uh, I'll say this to the young Christians here today, don't, don't get caught up in the small stuff. Um, what should rise to the top is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Uh, where do you put the believers of Christ? Uh, do, you, do you hold them in high esteem, the church that you go to? And are you experiencing God's help, truly experiencing God's help? Is, do you experience Christ ministering to you, helping you, whether it be an exam you're writing or you're talking to your friends at school or you're trying to resist that temptation, whatever it is, have you experienced God's help in what you're trying to do in, for him? I'm afraid that these things would come to rise to the top in your life. And it seemed to in Paul's life, he walked all over uh, Asia Minor and uh, Turkey and um, you know, Italy eventually um, putting all those steps on because he was convinced that this was a message worth sharing. And so we just leave that um, now. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word that simply puts it so well. We come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is monumental. He has a, he has a message, message worth sharing. And uh, it's to come to him by faith and let him provide that righteousness that we can never achieve on our own and experience that rest 
even though we're not going to be perfect after that, but you will help us to be more conformed into your image. We sang about that. More like you, Lord, more like you. We just pray that the aroma of Christ that we shed would be accepted, and not be um, resisted, but it would be entertained and it would come as a sweet smell to us. We know that you like, God likes to, to see things about Christ and the aroma of his life to send up to him. And, and we know that Christ pleases you. And we just pray, Lord, that we would just as Christians be devoted to doing that. And um, we just uh, pray for those things. We just pray for the meal now downstairs. We'd ask that you would just uh, help us to be thankful for it. And thankful for all the hands that provided these things. We take it from your hand again in Jesus' name. Amen.